So normally I'm going to take mainstream media headlines and filter them through. Every now and again, we'll pick something up from crypto Twitter and, and all the stuff that's going on in that world. So it's about financial relationships, this show. It's about the relationships that go into making dollars, the relationships that go into making Bitcoin. And we contrast those financial relationships and apply that filter to mainstream news stories and, and everything like that. But as I said, today's a little different because the story I want to talk about is about a different kind of financial relationship, one that isn't even always financial. It's about making babies, right? Sexual relationships. So today, it's not just about financial ones. There's a bit of money involved because Elon Musk, one of the most interesting people in the world, we can all agree, like him or hate him, one of the most interesting people in the world. And the Dogecoin guy said, we should be much more worried, remember the word worried, much more worried about population collapse. Okay, we should be much more worried about population class. I'm with you. Maybe, maybe. Um, you know, saying it to be shocking to the Malthusians, perhaps, who are always saying there's too many people. You know, I, I'm, I'm down with what he's saying. Vitalik Bitcoin, if, if you don't know who he is, he created Ethereum. It's another blockchain, right? Uh, a lot of people know him. Maybe not around here, but it's pretty famous. And he went into the thread and replied, disparities in economic success between men and women are far larger once marriage and children enter the picture. Synthetic wombs would remove the high burden of pregnancy, significantly reducing the inequality. Sounds okay. Sounds like it makes sense, right? It does kind of make sense. But let's go back to the worry piece, right? The worry piece. That was what caught my attention. So Elon Musk said we should be more worried or we're not worried enough or something along those lines. And it's contrasted with, here's a solution, synthetic wombs. Are synthetic wombs actually a solution to the population problem? Now, I use this framework called the fourth turning analysis. You can apply it to a lot of stuff. You hear it a lot in the Bitcoin space. Max Kaiser brings it up a lot. There's all kinds of people in the industry, especially Bitcoiners, who feel like the fourth turning is a useful framework. So I'm not inventing anything new. I'm applying this framework, and I'll let you know why synthetic wounds are a problem for Bitcoin in particular, and why some financial relationships, especially around those that are going to create the next generation of children, so Elon Musk's worry, might not be apparent if you start looking through this fourth turning analysis and apply some Bitcoin to it. So fourth turning analysis, fourth turning, I first learned about fourth turning from Willy Wu, a very famous, who even knows how to describe him in, in, in Bitcoin artist in some ways. Uh, the, his his uh, shit flows downwards painting, I tried to get hung up in the MoMA, it's all the charts of all the coins that sort of come and go and everything next to the Bitcoin network. It's a pretty nice piece of art. Um, so Willy Wu first taught me about the fourth turning a few years ago, just in time for 2020 COVID and all that stuff. If you want the best resource on fourth turning, so fourth turning, first of all, was a book written in the 1990s. And the reason why it has so many legs now is because it predicted 2020 really well. Not only did it predict 2020 really well, it was actually a marketing handbook for the entire late 90s and early 2000s. The authors of the book literally invented the word millennium and predicted a lot of their consumption habits, their tastes, and, and all kinds of other things. So they were that you know sort of guys that you'd hire in order to understand the psychology of consumers a little better. Really important point, really important point as we continue on in here, because I'll be mentioning the psychology of consumers a lot more in a second. So this book, Fourth Turning, the best explanation you can get on it is... The book, I guess, takes a long time to read, very academic, written in the 90s. Real Vision did a four-part series on it, in, uh, and you can get that on YouTube pretty good. They interview the, the Neil Howe, the author of the book, in four different places around Washington, D.C., with the backdrop being from that era each time. So really, really interesting production value. But the best video out there to get, and you'll understand the whole thing in under 10 minutes, is a, by a guy named Ben Neistat, so Casey Neistat's brother. Van nice that these guys basically invented viral videos and, and all that kind of stuff. They would drive bicycles through the Holland Tunnel in New York City in like 2000 and upload it to LimeWire and Kazaa, and they went viral because it was crazy to go through traffic at the time. And so these guys, huge success, huge career, some of the best YouTube video makers you will ever see. And so I direct you to Van Neistat's video, which he made this year, on the fourth turning. 
and it's about 10 minutes. And I've copied a bit of his framework. He uses like a rolled paper and, and is able to almost animate the video. It's, it's amazing. So I won't, I won't go too much into the fourth turning, but I'll borrow some of his terms here. I borrowed quite a few of them. The way he describes it, instead of the word they use in, so, so the basic gist of it is history is not a linear path. You can't just look at random dates assigned to eras like the Gilded Age and the Renaissance. And then when did that happen again? And I don't remember what was the date. That's not the right way to look at history. You look at history in terms of a human lifespan, 80 years, and you can break that human lifespan down to generations, 20 years each, and then they end up following the seasons. They follow the seasons. There's a summer, a, a winter, uh, you know, you get it. There's a beginning, middle, and an end to the whole thing. So four seasons. And it's remarkably predictive going forward, and it checks out going backwards. So you apply this framework to American history, and you see that 80-year blocks are a really useful way to understand what happened, and they check out each of those 20-year blocks. So 80 years ago, we had World War II, 80 years before that, the Civil War, 80 years before that, the Revolutionary War, 80 years before that, it was sort of the beginning of that travel time, and England had its own Civil War, so the Anglo-American piece starts taking over, and you can kind of imagine why, right? You have a generation that does really well, and then it takes a little while, and then the grandkids aren't getting so great. And the way it was broken down in this is you've got a high that lasts about 20 years, and an awakening period that lasts about 20 years, and an unraveling period, and finally a crisis period. The way the history blocks are broken down since World War II is we've got 46 to 64. The assassination of John F. Kennedy at the end of 63 is really the end of that golden era. What you've got is the beginning of rock and roll. You've got a really positive America where if you're just a single income earner pumping gas, you can actually have a home and kids and everything. And that's where the baby boom comes from. And that's really important because we're going to discuss that again with what Elon Musk said. Should we be worried about a baby boom or a population collapse, right? So remember that. In the 1950s, the late 40s and early 50s, the economic conditions at the time made it easy to have kids. You just go buy a house and have kids. Who cares, right? It was that simple. You didn't really have to worry too much. And, and what we talked about on yesterday's show, a little bit about property taxes and what neighborhood you want to live in and what school your kids should go to. And then buying a house is like the most active way you can be a consumer of education. All that was a lot easier in the 1950s because the money was brand new and the system was brand new and it kind of worked. And you go to 64 and now we start seeing what we call the awakening. You've got Bob Dylan, LSD, computers, Star Wars, the old one, you know, you had the fun stuff, space, jets, Corvette, bikinis, and now we start seeing that it's not quite as fun. So LSD is fun, but it's not quite the same experience as what happened before that. Then we see from 1984, what Van Neistat used as the pivot would be Reagan's second inauguration. I'll get to why that's important, because you can actually line this up with a real Bitcoin worldview and understand it quite well after and then that era ends, of course, with the 2008 financial crisis. Now, compare again these, these cultural trends, right? We go to the Berlin Wall, we've got the O.J. Simpson trial, 9-11, Kurt Cobain, N.W.A., you've got artists singing about urban decay, you've got, it's not a happy time necessarily if you contrast it with the 1950s, right? It's not, it's not the same messages, it's not the same feeling in America. And then finally, we come to 2008 till today. We've got a political divide, we've got COVID. And this is the thing. They predicted in this book written in 1997 that there would be something like a pandemic in the year 2020. And the repercussions would look a lot like they look today. So they predicted a pandemic as an example. They didn't predict that there would be a pandemic in 2020. They said there could be something like a pandemic. And then they described exactly the scenarios that we see today. Coercion, social manipulation, all things where neighbors are, are not necessarily getting along anymore. And, and let's remember that the vaccine mandates, COVID mass stuff, I'm not so worried about the government. It's your neighbor doing this, right? It's neighbors. It's all of us together. We're making choices that are really difficult to risk manage a lot of people at once. And there is no right or wrong answer, but you're seeing why neighbors are pitted against each other. Now let's go back to the Bitcoin way of seeing this. So I read Seyfedean's Fiat Standard when it came out last summer. And one thing I'll say that I appreciate about it is that he mentioned that fiat currency was an innovation in its time. And we have to respect that. If you look back to this high, as I mentioned, the guy pumping the gas, single income, was able to work pretty well. It made sense at the time and it worked. Entropy set in and it didn't work after. But for that early time, the Keynesians looked like they had it figured out. It looked good. Now what we see is, now <clears throat> we say it's the assassination of Kennedy, and then the gold standard falls in 1971, for those who weren't aware, and then that pivots the economy. But the conditions for 
1971 exiting of the gold standard by the Nixon administration started earlier. It started with those countries that America helped win this war saying, well, you might not be the safest country anymore for our gold. I don't know if we left it all there during World War II. Can we start buying it back? And America couldn't keep control of the gold anymore. They had to send it to the countries like Germany and France that wanted it back. And that took a few years to play out. So finally, in 1971, when America realized this was going to be a drain, they said, well, enough, right? We're just going to go full fiat and we'll see how it goes. Now, it's a great thing for America. Great thing for America. It had to help New York City a great deal for a long time. But then, of course, that only went to 1984. They unleashed forces on the 1970s economy, like inflation. They had to have those super high interest rates because they had to be serious about it. It was real cause and effect back then. It couldn't be wiped away with policy. But this Reagan 84 election has a major, major change because, of course, Reagan embraces Reaganomics. And he embraces high deficit spending in order to win the Cold War. So it's it's about spending as much as you can and lowering taxes. And that's where that huge American consumption machine goes into play. That idea of consumption economy as military protection came from Eisenhower in this era. Eisenhower, who understood the army very well, was not interested in more missiles. He was interested in an economy that had capacity to make more missiles when needed. He had a real tension against uh, the military establishment. Of course, everyone remembers his famous speech. His idea was to make sure Americans bought a lot of stuff and they thought they needed a lot of stuff. So the 1950s was about washing machines, buy this, buy that. And there was a guy named Bernays who, who realized that that was a, a, a good way to protect the country in the Cold War, make America so much richer, spend so much more money that no matter what, we'll have the strongest military just because we have the industrial capacity to pivot when we want. So it was not to stockpile missiles originally, right? It, it wasn't that. It was, let's be able to flex if we need to, but let's pacify now. And, and Eisenhower had that mentality. So in the end, we got the worst of both worlds because we got the consumption economy, but we'd stockpile the missiles too. So it wasn't exactly as Eisenhower intended. But the consumption piece ends up becoming really important here because basically America says we can outspend the Soviet Union, we can collapse the economic system. And they were right, it worked, right? And that's where you start to get into this unraveling. It did work. But the problem is, America got addicted to those economic policies that were really in, you know, mobilized to win a war. It wasn't really like, what do we do about this in 25 years when we've got you know, a housing crisis? They couldn't have predicted what that was going to do. They did manage with policy to, to, to suppress interest rates and, and, and you know, increase supply of money, but not inflation because the demand for U.S. dollars was global. It was a global economy that America ran. It was... When you, when you win the fight, you win the fight. There was no one else, right? So it bred a, a certain amount of complacency or who knows what, just no one was in charge, nobody home. Wall Street was as Wild West as you want it to be, really. You don't want to control it too much. It's got to be bottled lightning and it's got to be able to fail and lose and do all those things. It did all those things and more. So now you've got this wealth gap, right? You've got this wealth gap. And that's where Elon Musk's, I think anyway, Elon Musk's, problem or the problem we identify lies, right? We have this huge falling birth rate. You go to Japan, one of the great examples of it, I've lived in Japan a few times in my life, and it's pretty eerie when you go to the countryside and you see entire towns where there was a park for children with grass this high because it hasn't been children in 20 years. And then maybe you'll see two or three old people with canes walking down the road, but they're the only ones left in town. There's nobody else. The cities, you don't see that if you're in Tokyo or Osaka and these other places. Now, do they need 127 million people in that small place? I mean, it's pretty rural as it is, so they could probably even fit more. Uh, but, you know, quality of life, who knows? It's not for me to say what they do. They'll probably invent enough robots that it'll be just fine in that country. So we'll see. They've also stepped up immigration, so Japan has changed quite a bit as far as filling these towns, and we'll see what goes on in the future. But nevertheless, the economic considerations for Japanese people to have children are great. Children are expensive. It's not that simple anymore. And why is that? Well, we said yesterday, buying a house, getting in the right school district, all these things become really, really difficult. And the cost of modern life for normal families is tough. So how do you get out of this, right? How does this change? Well, when we think of the Bitcoin Center, one of the interesting things, and it's not a, it's not a prediction necessarily, and not even, uh, maybe we'll see, but it is amazing that the 80-year blocks also fit with two Bitcoin halvings from now. Uh, yeah, maybe, I don't know. We'll see. They're fitting right on time. So 
when I call this World War III, right, when I see this World War III, you can take the frame that as bad as things look right now in a crisis, the good things that will make it a golden age, again, right, a high, are just around the corner. And when you look at the early Bitcoin community, we can see those threads there already, things that could easily become dominant in the culture. So I call this the be high generation, right? We're already in space, right? We've already got miners up there. All those rockets that Elon Musk is sending up to space every day, inside of them are low orbit satellites that are just flying out of these rockets. And those will actually unwind us from our internet service providers, these bloodsuckers that will for sure clamp us down for anything that we do, right? I mean, Bitcoin has a very great danger with these, where you plug into the internet, where you get your signal. All of these satellites with Starlink now are gonna unbind us from all of that stuff. We'll be able to have this transmission from any island, not just Barbados where I am now that has good internet connection, but I'll be able to go anywhere in the jungle, right? Because you can have unbound internet collection connection and space is really everything right there's there's so much to do there and when you look at the advantage that some miners have i remember a presentation years ago by peter todd on breaking bitcoin called if elon musk is a space pirate and what he said was he can get free solar energy unfettered by the atmosphere with satellites in space that with the latency of mining from space to earth wouldn't be so great so you can mine for free right it's a pretty dastardly attack on bitcoin but it, it checks out right it's, it's it could be there now, I'm sure there'll be competition and it won't be that simple, but one can imagine miners in space pretty easily for that reason, especially when we've got a fellow like that, the Dogecoin guy throwing them up every day, right? <clears throat> the other one I, I believe you'll have is this sort of inexpensive luxury, right? So uh, you'll be able to travel different places and it won't be that expensive. Now, I don't mean you're, you're going to be in a vehicle that is... Like, you know, not exactly like a Tesla car, but if you want to increase the birth rate, imagine you're in a car that's self-driving and it's like a living room and you can actually travel. And I'm pretty sure baby making is going to happen if you're not even driving. If you're just like, let's go down the coast and you're actually in your moving living room, right? And when you actually look at the, the parts that go into these electric vehicles, you have to imagine the complete price collapse of them. So we see them as expensive today, but when you actually look at the number of parts in an electric vehicle, it's minimal compared to a combustion engine. We go from like, I don't know, over 10,000 little parts to, you know, a couple of thousand. And the simplicity of not having to have a, you know, burn carbon engine, just, just a simple drivetrain that works on a supercapacitor battery, you can start having a tinkering industry of car makers again. You can start modifying old frames. You could put batteries into them. Once you have the base units, you can get back to that old 1950s, I'm going to build a hot rod and go cruising down the road and have fun. But you can do it in a way that will probably make more baby making because as i said there might even just be moving living rooms down the highway you'll be able to travel maybe slower but further and with greater leisure than ever before royalty markets so this is something that you know and and notice each of these qualities each of these qualities here the way i'm describing them what i'm actually talking about is getting rid of those trusted third parties the ones that are critical to get rid of so if we look at space, it's about really about getting right now our internet service providers and all those guys and having a direct link to a global communications network that doesn't rely on expensive physical infrastructure on the ground that they can choke. Inexpensive luxury, that's that's really again third parties, you know, if, if you're able to get rid of certain corporate interests, if you're able to take houses, for example, that don't, are no longer used as a store of value in order to fulfill the shortcomings of the money as a store of value. So that's kind of what we did as a generation here. When the money was no longer good as a store of value, people started to buy houses. And houses became a major vehicle for wealth transfer, for savings. Many people's pensions are essentially the equity in a house. Houses became a, a dominant, dominant feature for many great reasons. But are they the best store of value for your work and your effort? A lot of complications in there. A lot of other factors, a lot of third parties that you have to deal with. It's, it's as I said, the school taxes. All these other things are layered on top of it where you're living. What we've got with this COVID situation is normalization of work from home. And that definitely will break some of the entrenched interests in New York City and all these other places that have no problem. You know, um, It's a real market, essentially, but it's, it's twisted by policy. And then royalty markets, what I'm saying there is you have creative class people 
that no longer have to go through publishers. And, and we're at the early stage of that right now, but you know, as a science fiction writer myself, and the reason why I even did this fourth turning analysis and why I'm sharing all of this with you is because of this last point. So I recently wrote a science fiction book called The Satoshi Wedding Murders. And I used this fourth turning analysis to try to imagine what uh, an entropic force on Bitcoin would look like. And in the end, what I decided was in, in the story, I don't want to give too much away, but what you've got is a world with no material want, really. And markets such as prostitution have all but dissolved because no one is needing to sell themselves. However, the demand for such things is still there. People still want to buy others. That hasn't stopped. So while people don't need to do it, don't need to sell their body, other people want to buy. And in this world, secretly, covertly, there is a great effort to create basically human life again that you can own. And in my world, the entropic forces that end up threatening Bitcoin are literally life creation markets. So create, diverting energy that would otherwise go to hash power to creating life that really is just sycophantic followers of the people who create it. They don't really, it's, it's a different kind of slavery. You don't necessarily own them. You engineer them to love nothing but you. And, and that becomes a whole new marketplace and, and one that does threaten Bitcoin's sort of supremacy. Um, never forget in Bitcoin, it's a peer-to-peer -peer market, right? And not everyone is the peers, right? We, we can all be honest about that. You're mining, you're running a node, sure, you're a peer. You're just a human being, not always, right? Not always. And, and so the whole story is based on that piece. What does being a peer mean? And at a certain point, entropy can enter that definition. And in my world, being a peer ends up meaning you got to own a lot of people. Not a good thing. And, and so I only meant that as, as, you know, it's speculative fiction. I don't know if it's true, but I mean it to tie the, the, the bow on this idea of what Elon Musk said. Should we worry about birth rate? I think Bitcoin is going to usher in a high. And I think the financial relationships that, that come from this winning of World War III, this be high era will take care of that problem of birth rates. The one to worry about indeed is the synthetic wounds. It's not a solution to the problem at all. It could be one of the most dangerous things we ever do. And in 80 years in my story anyway, that's what Bitcoin is dealing with. It's dealing with synthetic life that's owned by other people that doesn't really participate in the network the way you would imagine. And, and so not a solution, definitely a problem. Uh, so a bit of a different episode today. But that's what we got. Awesome, Nolan. Thanks a lot. I really like I really like that comparison. I think the four the fourth turning is on a lot of people's minds <laughs> lately. So I recommend to everyone go check out that Van Nice stat. This, this is almost exactly copied. I put this red line in because to me this is the fourth turning from a pure Bitcoin lens, right? We see Bretton Woods working. We see the conditions with America going just berserk in the 60s, you know, with protests and, and not being seen as the safe haven where you should store your gold anymore. If you, if you were waking up from World War II and America was clearly supreme in the end of that era, you know, it would make sense in the late 60s if you said, well, I can probably take care of myself now if you're France or Germany or something. And that's what precipitated this whole change. And of course, the conditions go straight up into the 84 era when Reagan does what it was that he did, which made sense. It was a strategic move. Um, but the repercussions were the 08 financial crisis. And here we are. And here we are. Hey, Q, thanks for joining us. How are you doing? Thanks for letting me uh, come on. Nolan, this has been really fun following along, man. Your segments this week have been great. Yeah, I mean... I, I, like I said, if you go to see Van Neistat's video on this, you're going to get a great sense of, you know, he even rolls this thing and it goes up and down and uh, it's top quality production. So uh, I recommend it. Yeah. We'll have to send a, send a link out to the chat for our followers. And he should make some Bitcoin great. videos, by the way, because if the quality of his videos uh, for this one, for example, can be replicated in, in our context, it's a win for everybody. Uh -huh.